Professor, uh, Professor uh, uh, Koen Jensens uh, from uh, uh, University of Antwerp in Belgium. Uh, he's uh, working, I think, from uh, his PhD times uh, with X-ray spectroscopy and uh, microscopy uh, as a technique for uh, non-destructive analysis of different materials. Um, and uh, this kind of analysis allows him to do imaging on microscopic scale, uh, but also on macroscopic scale. So uh, analysis that he did uh, were typically from environmental samples, uh, speaking about um, uh, polluted uh, uh, materials such as soil sediments or uh, airborne materials. But a special uh, interest, of course, comes from uh, another field, which is cultural heritage. Uh, so these methods, uh, 2D and also 3D imaging, can be used uh, to analyze uh, uh, materials from uh, important for, for conservation of cultural heritage. Uh, so uh, uh, paintings, for example, glasses, um, uh, and uh, other, I'm not, well, pigments, yes, of course, and inks. Uh, and the combination that he uses in recent time is not only microanalysis uh, on the microscopic level, of, for example, pigments, but also this kind of analysis to make uh, X-ray images of the whole painting with uh, large uh, dimensions, so in a way, uh, chemical imaging of uh, old paintings. Uh, so, uh, Professor uh, Jensens has, is a uh, co-author and author of uh, more than 200 scientific papers uh, from the field of uh, 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 conservation of cultural heritage and also uh, author of four, uh, editor of four scientific books. Today, uh, he will explain to us how um, it is possible to examine old paintings with uh, new eyes as a matter of fact, X-ray eyes. So, please, the floor is yours. Okay. So, thank you. Uh, so, I, I hope everyone can hear me when I speak at this uh, level. Yes. So, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be in these parts of the Mediterranean, so to speak, especially here in Slovenia. Um, so, I'm going to speak about uh, paintings and fine arts, as it's called. Uh, although I'm a chemist, huh? I'm not an art historian or an art conservator. And uh, as uh, was already said in the introduction, normally I collaborate a lot with physicists. Uh, and so from that, let's say, area of chemistry and physics, we tend to provide new ways of looking at paintings, which are useful then usually not for chemists and physicists, but for people that are related to museums. And there are different types of new information we can provide to these people. So I will come to that. Um, I don't speak any Slovenian, nothing uh, of Slavic languages. I'm sorry for that, but uh, it's like this. What um, in the chemical research is uh, very relevant these days is if you want to do chemical if you want to produce chemical products, you should do this in a very environmentally friendly way, to do this in a durable way, so that you can keep on doing that. Huh? Now, in the art world, and objects, uh, art objects, they're also made of all kinds of chemical materials. Durability is also relevant, because these objects should keep on living. They should keep in their, the way they are at the moment, and keep on looking that way, for many hundreds of years. And many works of art have done that, but some have not. Some have changed the way they look relative to when the artist created them. So questions of durability of chemical species also come up in art conservation. But if we want to talk about the relation between chemistry and art, and, and more specifically chemical imaging and art, then these conservation questions come up. But of course, there are also a lot of historical questions that arise. Because objects which you encounter in the arts usually are or can be quite old, 100 years old when it's a painting by Van Gogh, 
but maybe also 400 years old when it's a painting by Rubens, or 2000 when it's a Roman fresco, or even older. Yeah? And so historical data and historical information which one can learn from art objects is an interesting topic to pursue. And when we, when we try to do that with chemical imaging, sometimes we have to not just look on the surface of the art objects, but we have to dig a little bit deeper below the surface. Huh? So what we're doing is we're digging inside, like archaeologists are digging, but we're not really digging because art objects, especially old ones, are valuable and unique and precious and protected. So we dig, the, we, we dig into the surface, but in a virtual way. Yeah? And with X-rays, we can do that relatively easily. And so we call this virtual archaeology we're doing on art objects. OK. And so with that, we get chemical insights. And in general, let's say, they allow us to explore better a work of art. And it happened to us several times, many times already, that uh, people that before, typically art historians, that look at, at a, a work of art only with their eyes, we can provide them with new information. Even those specialists that have been working with those works of art for many, many years and know it completely, we can still provide them with new information by looking below the surface. Okay. I hope you can see this a little bit, um, but the lights are also very important, of course. Um, so what you see here is a fresco from the Villa of the Mystery, uh, the Mysteries, Villa de Misteri in Pompeii. Huh? And I show this uh, just to give you one of the reasons why paintings are considered to be important art objects, at least in Western culture, not necessarily in the Asian culture, but in Western culture it is. And of course, the obvious reason is we can look through them and look into the past. Eh? And we can read about the past and how the Romans uh, behaved and how they interacted with each other. But if you can look at something like on a fresco like this, it allows you to imagine much easier how the Romans lived and what roles various people had in a household, etc. So windows of the past are, are very important, and that's why we, we preserve uh, these things. Another reason why paintings are important um, is, uh, and here I show an example, uh, as example, a painting by Rubens. Rubens is a Baroque-era painter, which I know quite well because his home city is, my home city is Antwerp. And so uh, Rubens made a lot of paintings, which he sold to the kings of France and the kings of Spain and other important people. But he also made a smaller series of paintings of his own family. And this is one of his daughters, Clara Serena. Huh? Now, yeah, with the lighting conditions, you don't really see the splendor, the full splendor of this painting. But not everyone can make a painting like this. Huh? It's difficult to make. And even though Rubens was very active, made several thousand paintings, this is still a very valuable painting. It's in Vienna, in um, the Liechtenstein collection. And so they're also rare and therefore precious. That's another reason why people try to preserve paintings. So difficult to make and rare. And another very important reason, which sometimes are, is a little bit overlooked by natural scientists, is of course that paintings, many paintings, not all, are very beautiful. Huh? For instance, this Van Gogh painting has a very nice balance between the green, the blue, and the yellow. And also the way it's painted uh, is appreciated by many people. So there's another reason uh, uh, why uh, this is the case. OK. So, but paintings are usually quite difficult. Huh? If we look, for instance, at the paintings here on the wall or on the ceiling, they are not so difficult. They are usually, there is only one layer on top of a ground. So that's relatively simple. But the oil paintings I've just shown you, to get this high level effect, this realism, or the effect the artist wanted, normally many layers are used on top of each other. Maybe not as much as here. Huh? Here are, there are 10, 20 on top, but five or six of different colors and different transparency, etc., and different thickness is quite, sim is, is quite common. 
So, and usually what we, what we see with our own eyes is the top layer and some contributions from below. Uh, but if we start looking at that with X-rays, which are much more deeper to go into material, we tend to get information from all these layers sometimes together. And that can be interesting, can also be confusing. Okay. So, uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, paintings I would like to start with to show you a little bit our starting point uh, in, in developing new ways of looking at paintings is this triptych. It's in the Prado Museum in Madrid. It's by somebody called Bosch, uh, Hieronymus Bosch, who was living in the, in the yeah, 15th, 16th century. It's called the Garden of Earthly Delights. It's a very well-known painting. And so the middle here is the earth. This is heaven, paradise, and this is hell. Uh, maybe you saw this already. There's a lot of things happening on the earth. Uh, too far, too many things to explain. Uh, you have to go to Madrid and look at this very long, at this painting. It's very interesting. Here in paradise, not too much is happening. Everyone is happy. Uh, uh, there are some strange animals there, but usually it's a bit boring. And there's a lot, a lot of interesting things happening in hell here. Uh, so we look at that. Uh, um, so what usually has happened, well, if, we, if you want to look a little bit inside a painting in a, in a, in a panel or in a canvas, is that we shoot with X-rays through the painting, and so the painting is put on a table and then there is a source of X-rays below the table and you shoot through and you put photographic film on top of the painting and then you blacken this and then you have many of these little uh, <coughs> X-ray plates and so nowadays they're scanned in and then glued together and then you get this, this kind of uh, compound uh, image. Okay, now for, for those that, uh, that are scientists here in the, the audience, what we get here, this black and white image, normally you call this a shadow image eh, or a medical X-ray, uh, where in a medical X-ray you would see the bones, eh, which is black, uh, white, on a black background. Here you see the material that more strongly absorbs the X-rays than the rest. Actually, there is only one material, one pigment, and does this, and this is lead white. There is a lot, probably a lot of lead white here in the ceiling too. Eh? It's a very well known and very, very frequently used uh, uh, pigment. But there are many other pigments in there and we don't see those. Eh? I don't know whether you will be able to see this, but if you look for instance here, this little white man eh? on the boat in the river, this river is the Styx eh? that uh, flows through hell. We see the little white man because he's painted with lead white and this absorbs the X-rays. Eh? And there are all kinds of other things that are absorbing the X-rays. And so, yeah, it's a bit difficult to see, but you see here, for instance, this little white arm that comes out of the flute, we see that too. Huh? So, we clearly see that, but we don't see the flute. But it's there, yet we don't see it. Why is that? Because it's painted not with lead white, but with some brown pigment, some earth color pigment, and that doesn't absorb too much. So this X-ray radiography, that's what it's called, and this shadow imagery is meant to look below the surface and indeed here you see something which is now below the surface. Bosch apparently first painted some kind of monster that came out of the river and then changed his mind and overpainted it again. So we don't see it anymore but it's still there. Yet things that are on the surface and don't absorb too much, we don't see it. So this is the strength and also the limitation of X-ray radiography you get a black and white image, and not everything is there. Uh, it's a bit like looking at an X-ray radiograph, a medical X-ray radiograph from a family. You see the main things, you see that there is a father and a mother, and a daughter and a son, and that they are with four and not five, but many other things you don't see. Huh? Only the, the basic things are, are, are visible. Okay, so then uh, this is where our, our involvement, let's say, with X-rays and painting started. Um, so not far from here, a little bit to the north, is uh, in Trieste. There is something, is an institute called Synchrotrone Trieste. It's a very big machine that produces very intense X-rays. So there are more of these institutes throughout Europe. And one of them is in Hamburg. Uh, it's in the north of Germany. 
And well, we see, you see myself here as a version of 10 years ago, huh? a little bit younger. Uh, but we are still, um, we're, we're all very happy because this is our last experiment of the year. It was a kind of Christmas experiment and the experiment was fairly successful. And what we were trying to do was to examine a small painting you see here uh, behind us in this large machine. Huh? So what we were looking at, we were looking at a small Van Gogh painting like this. And we managed to convince this lady who is a museum curator to come and bring her painting to, uh, to the synchrotron, which is not so easy to do. Eh? You cannot just take a Van Gogh and put it in your briefcase and go somewhere. It requires guards and insurances and a truck and blah, blah, blah. Anyhow, we were there and we managed to do an experiment by shooting with an X-ray beam, uh, which is not so big, and then moving this painting through and then seeing what would happen. Now, uh, yeah, I, I draw it here, but people should not be in the same room where this very intense X-ray beam is, but okay, that's not really important. What surprised us is that when we're doing this serpentine movement and collecting information from many positions on the painting, that we could obtain an image which looked very different, completely different than what you could see with your own eyes on the surface. Yeah? And we see here a color picture, more or less, and that's because we used something called X-ray fluorescence and the information comes from two chemical elements, antimony and mercury, and they're in two pigments that Van Gogh used called Naples yellow and vermilion red. Yeah? So we picked that up by scanning and by collecting information which is specific to these two chemical elements. And uh, in this way, uh, we got this image. Okay. So let's look a little bit more in detail. Eh? Here is our uh, curator again. We're in, at this position, positioning the, the painting. And uh, you see here more or less somewhere in the back here is the synchrotron that will produce X-rays. And then uh, if, if a beam of X-rays hits the painting here, eh? we get what, what we in, in, in physics call a fluorescence phenomenon. So fluorescence means you shoot light onto a material and the material will send light back. It will not reflect the same light, no, it will absorb the light, and then it will emit light of its own. That's a fluorescence phenomenon. If you do this in the X-ray range, you use energetic radiation, X-rays, and then the atoms which absorb the X-rays, uh, primary X-rays, will send out different wavelengths, which I've given different colors here, but it's all X-rays, so we don't really see that. Huh? with our own eyes. Nevertheless, all these different wavelengths in the X-ray range, they show up as peaks here, and all these peaks in the spectrum refer to different chemical elements. And so you see this antimony we already spoke about, and mercury, but also quite a few other elements, like lead and arsenic and chromium and copper. But apart from the antimony and the mercury, all these are relatively it, it wasn't so surprising that they were there. Huh? So we do this from one point, and then we go to the next, and we do the same, and we do this, let's say, a million times. We go on many, many points and collect all this information, and then uh, we can translate this into images. We can figure out how much chromium we see on this position, and the next one, and the next one, and we can produce a chromium map, a chromium distribution image. Huh? And this is not very interesting. You see here where Van Gogh used green brush strokes on the surface. Okay? We, can, we don't need a complicated experiment to get these maps. We can just look at that or take a picture with a normal camera. So that's not really extra information. Huh? But when we look at the mercury and the antimony, you obviously see something different than the brush strokes Van Gogh used on the surface. You see below, you, see, you look through, See below the surface where Van Gogh painted with another pigment in a different way. Okay? So this, 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 this kind of multicolored painting was something Van Gogh made when he was in Paris. Huh? So Van Gogh has a fairly short career, only 10 years. He learned how to paint in Holland, but he painted there usually in a rather 
let's say, depressive way or uh, not terribly uh, interesting way with a lot of browns and blacks. Uh, it's only when he comes to Paris and gets to know the Impressionists who paint with a lot more vivid colors that he also starts painting like this. Yeah? So this here, this, this portrait, is from his early period, and what is on top is a later period. Huh? So, um, yeah, so you see it here a bit more, uh, more in detail. So what we've created here is a window by using X-rays and this fluorescence into a little bit the past of the painting. Yeah? We look at uh, the lower level. Uh, and then what you can also do, you can do some processing of this so that a number of artifacts are removed. Voila. Um, and then this, this painting becomes a little bit better, huh? and you start uh, really recognizing uh, a figure. So what Van Gogh painted in this early period, he was in small villages in Holland, he painted the peasants, both the lady peasants and the male peasants, and so obviously this is a lady peasant. Okay, so um, when we were doing this experiment about 10 years ago, at that time, I thought, well, okay, this has worked. Huh? Uh, the, up, the upper layer was not so thick that we could not see through, and Van Gogh was so kind to use different pigments in the upper and in the lower layer so they don't overlap and things like that. Maybe we will never find another painting where we also get a lot of this new information. But this turned out not to be the case. In the meantime, we already have examined many, many paintings, over 100, and in quite a few cases, this is so that we get new information. Otherwise, I would not be talking about this here. Um, so you see, the, wh what we've done is we've made machinery that allows us to bring them to museums so that we don't need to bring paintings to big physical installations like synchrotrons. And that works, of course, much better. Huh? Uh, when you need to convince a museum that you want to examine with X-rays one of their paintings, when you tell them you will, we will do it under your nose, in your own building, with your own security measures, etc., it's usually much easier. The opposite is very expensive and difficult to organize. Okay. So, and we have involved there uh, a company called Brücker, which is in Berlin, to make uh, a, a scanner like that. Um, and for instance, one of, the, one of the early examples we did eh, was this Goya painting. So this is in the, in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, and the painting was painted by Goya, uh, who lived, let's say, around the time of the Emperor Napoleon. Yeah. So uh, Napoleon obviously was in France, but uh, he had a brother, Joseph Napoleon, and Napoleon Bonaparte made his brother uh, King of Spain. And around the king, of course, there was a big royal household, with a number of military people in there. And Goya was painting these people. But, of course, Napoleon and his empire did not last very long. And when Napoleon no longer was emperor, his brother no longer was king of Spain. So there was a kind of revolution. And Goya lived through that and ended up with a number of paintings of the important people from the previous regime he could not sell anymore. So he overpainted them with something else, with people from the new regime. And this Don Roman, 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 yeah, Roman Satoué is of the new regime, is a judge of the high court in Madrid. But as I said, uh, Goya recycled a general's portrait. Huh? And so by scanning this, we can again look through the upper layer and it's quite different. Huh? Of course, this, this one is standing, it's a civilian obviously, and this one is sitting and is much more richly dressed, has a uniform with a gold and a red sash, etc. And so, indeed, we can look here. And by, by also identifying some of the uh, stars, the insignias on the, on the uniform, we are fairly certain that this is one of the top generals of this uh, Joseph Napoleon's regime. Anyhow. So this works quite well. Um, and yeah, here we are actually, this picture is now a combination of four colors and four chemical elements. And as I said, we already have examined quite a few paintings, uh, uh, mostly in Holland and Belgium, uh, and a lot of Van Gogh's. 
and also quite a few Rembrandt paintings. And we are starting now also to look at other, uh, other, uh, other uh, artists. And so this can be f paintings which are, let's say, about 100 years old, or from the Baroque era, so from the 1700s, or some of these are even earlier, like this one, they are from the 1500s. Okay, so we'll, I'll give you a few examples. And actually, uh, as I was saying in the beginning, you can, we, can, we found out by analyzing this large series of paintings that we can answer questions which come from different types of people that are related to paintings. Huh? If you're in a museum, there are art curators and art uh, historians there, so conservators. Huh? Artists usually are not in a museum, but art historians, curators and conservators. They usually want to know what is the current state of the painting and what will, the, especially these two, what will happen to the painting in the future. Will it still look in 100 years like it looks now or maybe not? Art historians, they are the opposite. Eh? They want to know the history, how was it created, uh, is it really connected to this artist and what's the relation to other paint, paintings of the same period. And then in between, if the, if the painting is not yet in a museum, it's maybe in private hands, or it's being sold, then you have art dealers and, their, and the owners of the painting. They're more, they're more interested in how much is the painting worth, and is it really associated with the artist we claim it, is, it should be associated with. Huh? So for instance, this one, is this really a Van Gogh? Or is, it, is, there, is there maybe some doubt? Huh? Um, and so these people have different questions. And uh, an example is shown here. Huh? So you have this painting, which is a big flower piece. Huh? And well, as you see, everyone around there is happy. Again, um, this picture was taken when we had jointly, jointly decided that this was a Van Gogh after 20 years of doubt and discussion. Well, it's a bit complicated story. This painting was bought in a collection at around 1910, and around 90 years, it was considered to be a real Van Gogh. But it's rather large, and a number of art historians thought or said, well, Van Gogh has never painted flower pieces like this. He always paints them separate without all this stuff below. It's a bit strange, it's a strange format. So from 2003 to 2012, they declassified it. They took it out of the collection. Yeah? They said, well, unknown artist, but not Van Gogh. Yet th this was not agreed upon by everyone. And so in 2012, we examined this by looking below the surface. And since then, it's back in the fray. Let's say it's again a new Van Gogh, a, a real Van Gogh. So what did we find below the surface? We found two men. Huh? You see them here. Uh, so by doing normal X-ray radiography, you can see that already, but you don't really see very much details. So these are two men that hold each other, and we call them the wrestlers. Yeah? Um, so they are, they are not really fighting, they are just holding each other in a kind of classic academic pose. Yeah? So this was normal. And the, the layer with the, the flowers is on top of these wrestlers. And then there are several other layers below, which complicate things a bit. So we scan that, and then uh, we start to see better what they are doing. Yeah? We see, for instance, the left man, he holds the arm of the other man, as you see here, yeah? but he's not really punching, yeah? he's just holding him. And so we saw clearly that this was an academic pose. Now, Van Gogh has never drawn or painted academic poses in his career, except for one month. And in that month, he was passing through Antwerp. Eh? So we had this Dutch period, and then the Parisian and the Provence period. He was for one month in Antwerp at the academy, but he didn't like it there because he was given too much instructions. Nevertheless, he writes, eh? Van Gogh writes during his entire life to his brother what's happening to him. He writes, well, I, have to, I had to buy a very big canvas, and I'm... I'm I have to uh, draw, or I have to paint these two men 
in, uh, that pretend to be wrestlers. Now, uh, it's not only that. Uh, so these are two indications that indeed uh, this, this painting was made in Antwerp and later overpainted. But there are some more indications. Huh? So if we look at two chemical elements, zinc, where you see the arms, which is white, and then there is mercury also, which gives these red shades on the arms of the wrestlers. At first, we didn't really understand that. But then somebody said, well, it's very logical. If you look at other Antwerp painters, like Rubens, they also do that. They use this red, even though it's not really meant literally as red, they use it as a kind of shade. Yeah? And in one of his letters, Van Gogh says, well, in Antwerp, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to paint like Rubens and Jordaan. So he didn't like to do that, but that was the way uh, he was taught to do that. And apparently he did. He used this red shading. And so there are other indications, for instance, here, uh, the way he sketches the arm or the hand of one of the men it's very much like, for instance, in one of his other uh, paintings called the Potato Eaters, where you also see this. Huh? So all these indications, which we discovered below the surface, strengthened the link to, to Van Gogh. And so uh, in this way, uh, we were able then to bring it back into the, uh, yeah, into the oeuvre of Van Gogh. Now, this was a cause for celebration. Eh? I don't know whether I can, uh, I can show you this little video here. It's very short. In the, in the, in the museum, uh, this was in 2012, huh? uh, they re-unveiled the Van Gogh, muse the, the Van Gogh uh, painting. Eh? There was a lot of applause and champagne being drunk. And so now it's back in the gallery. Before, this was in the reserves and uh, it was not considered to be... Uh, uh, a, a, real, uh, a real thing. Yeah. So by using the Van Gogh letters and the indications we found, this was possible to do. Um, all right, let me see. Oh yeah, uh, actually in 2012 this, was, this image was in a, in a series of science images selected by Spiegel online as the images of the year 2012. This was nice. It's not a very nice image, but nevertheless uh, it was considered to be a significant one. So um, then I would like to um, show you a little bit more on uh, distinguishing the difference between early and late paint in a painting. Hmm? So we looked already at a few very strong, strongly different examples, but sometimes the, the difference is a bit more subtle. And so the, the example I would like to show you here is from Rubens. So I told you already Rubens painted all kinds of things, but some there is a special collection which is related to his family. Huh? And this is in that collection is double special in the sense that what you see here is the second wife of Rubens. Huh? His first wife was on, of the same age as he, but she died, so he married when he was advanced in age. And so his second wife, Hélène Fourmont, she is about 30 years younger than he is. And so uh, he painted her when they were married recently, <clears throat> 1638 is two years before Rubens dies. Huh? So he was very much in love with her. Maybe you don't see that very well, but she's not wearing a lot of clothes. Huh? She only wears a fur coat. And so this is called the fur or the little fur, la pellice in Italian. And it's, in, it's, one, of the, it's one of the famous paintings in the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna. So this painting was never sold by Rubens, was meant for his, let's say, personal use, was meant for maybe to decorate uh, personal uh, uh, rooms in his house or maybe the bedroom. And it was also interpreted that he painted his wife in the intimacy of their matrimony, let's say, yeah? in, in the bedroom. But nevertheless, there are some patches in this painting which are a little bit strange. Um, which the art historians of the Kunsthistorisches Museum were wondering about what they meant. And so, uh, if, you, if you lighten a little bit, you see that there is something here. Huh? And so we scanned this area with our scanner uh, two years ago in Vienna. Um, and uh, here is one of my collaborators doing this. Huh? So we have our scanner there. Um, and then you see, if we look at some of the images, 
especially the lead, you start recognizing something. Eh? You see here that there is a lion's head. And there is some blue there. Eh? There is some blue water coming out of the lion's head. So it's certainly not inside. Or it, I mean, Rubens did have a very nice house, but he did not have a, a house with fountains inside. Eh? And also there is a little boy here. Eh? There is a cupid there. So together, this water spewing lion's head and some kind of plateau with a cupid statue. This is, yeah, this is garden architecture. And so we thought, OK, so it's not in the bedroom. It's outside. Huh? The house of Rubens in Antwerp had a large garden, more or less with this kind of ornaments in it. But for the art historians of the Kunsthistorisches Museum, this was big news. Because they were thinking already for a long time, and all their colleagues too, this is a very intimate portrait of Rubens that nobody will have seen. He painted it inside. Yet now, all of a sudden, apparently, he painted his wife more or less nude outside. So this was a big, big change. We still need to scan the rest of the painting. Maybe we will find a bit more indications that indeed it was outside and not inside. So this was nice because we could really provide new information on this painting. Uh, yeah, and so you see here a little bit blue water coming out of uh, this, this uh, garden statue. And yeah, and then now there is a big discussion among the art historians uh, related to Rubens or specialized in Rubens on what this means. Eh? Why was it there? Well, maybe there was no special reason why it was there, but why was it covered up? Eh? Why did, was it Rubens who did that? Or did, when he died, did his wife order this to do it so that the painting looks a bit less uh, libertine or something like that? It's not so clear at the moment. And this was also in the news, etc. cetera. Um, and um, yeah, so this was, uh, the, was dubbed to be a sensual secret that we revealed. It's a bit much, a bit of an exaggeration, but anyhow. Um, another, another painting of the same period, also the Baroque period, is by another famous artist, Dutch artist Rembrandt. Huh? Rembrandt was a bit later than Rubens. He died 1664, 65. So this is one of the last large paintings made by Rembrandt, when he was already very well established, when he had a lot of experience. It's called The Syndix. And art historically, it's very well appreciated because it is considered to be yeah, Rembrandt at its sumum. So you see four, five people, and they are members of the Draper's Guild. So the Draper's Guild was clothmaker's guild, eh? so they made cloth, which was a, an expensive kind of textile. These people were elected once a year, and they, they were quality control people. Yeah? And so there were two Protestants and two Catholics, and then one neutral, etc. So it's a high profile, and there was a lot of discussion apparently among these people. And what Rembrandt managed to do was to capture the action. They are not sitting there like wooden statues around the table. They're doing something. And Rembrandt has captured that. And so for a long time, people have said, ah, oh, well, this is the famous Rembrandt. At the end of his life, he just painted this as it is. Eh? It's captured. And uh, this was the genius of Rembrandt. Well, if we examine the painting, actually, what you have to look for is this man here. Eh? So these, are, these five are the members. And this one is their servant. Yeah? And so we look here at our scan, again the lead image. If you look carefully, you see the same figure here on this side. So this was the original position of the servant, but this was painted out. So Rembrandt first put him here and then made up his mind not to put him there. So we have that as first position. Then, a bit clearly, but still there, that was the second position. But Rembrandt did not like that either. And then he moved him to there. Yeah? But he's still not there. Eh? He moved him again to there. That's the final position. So rather than have this genius eh, that captures, what, that uses a painting like uh, a photograph, apparently Rembrandt took a while to really reconfigure the figures so that they are now in the position they are. Eh? And by putting him here, yeah, he had to make a little bit room here, eh? because originally that was not seen. If you look carefully, the hat of this 
member was longer, it was up to here, and now this, he has a shorter hat. The others, they all had the same hat, but this one is now shorter, otherwise you could not see the servant so very well. So that's that, and then he had to move this one, who was originally there, he had to move him. So he, 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 he shoved him over, and then yeah, the other one comes closer. So rather than have the genius Rembrandt, you have someone who controls things or is moving things, like on a stage, yeah? and repaints and repaints and does it until it's really as he likes it. Yeah? So he can learn all these things by looking below the surface. So again, new information. Another question one might have is, uh, so, as I said, uh, this is a 14th century painting, or 15th century painting, no, 16th, by an Antwerp painter called Metzes. It's called uh, Judith. Judith with the head of Holofernes. This is a biblical story, which some of you may know or may not know. So, uh, Judith is a Jewish heroine, and she is a heroine because she saves her country from invasions from the Hittites. Uh, from people coming into what is now Palestine, Israel, from, from the north, from uh, Mesopotamia. And she did this in a very effective way. She sneaked into the tent of the leader of these invaders and she cut off his head. Huh? It's very effective of uh, uh, sabotaging uh, an invading force. Now, this biblical story is sometimes depicted in a very graphic way, eh? for instance by Caravaggio, he, he captures the effective moment, the head goes off. Usually this is not the case, usually it's the moment after that uh, is depicted, like here by Cranach. And for instance this famous Klimt uh, figure is also Judith, and if you know it's Judith, it should be Judith and the head of Holofernes, you can recognize the head here. Eh? But anyhow, so this is what we see here. Nevertheless, the original painting, which now looks a little bit flat, uh, it's, it's brown and another kind of brown and a bit greenish brown and a bit reddish brown, originally looked much more colorful. And why is that? Well, if we look below the surface, we don't really see anything new, but we can look at different chemical elements and we know which elements were responsible for a certain color. Huh? So let here is the background, that's not so interesting, we see a little bit better that there is a tent here where the lady is in, but for instance, cobalt can only be in a pigment which originally was blue, it's called smalt. Huh? And smalt, okay, now there is some chemistry which I will not go into, but you see here, smalt was already used by the Greeks and the Egyptians to make this very nice blue glass, and that's inside parts of the cloak of Judith. Yeah? So it looked a bit like this originally. Uh, and then something happened so that the color changed. Maybe it looked much more blue originally, like that. We don't really know. But now it has lost all its blue color because of a change in coordination. I will not go into that. And then there are some other elements, like copper, which maybe looked green and was in the drapery behind. And we also see some iron which is in the jewelry. Yeah? So probably the painting looked much more like this originally. Yeah? So this is now being restored, and by doing this a priori virtual reconstruction, we help more or less the restorers to imagine what they should go into, eh? in which direction they should go. Normally, in reality, they cannot really restore all these colors, but at least when they encounter some green in an area where they expect it to be, at least it, it's more recognizable that way. Yeah? And of course, this kind of virtual reconstructions can be put next to the real painting in the museum uh, for, to inform the public. And then, uh, uh, maybe as, as one of the last examples is, uh, we're, we're getting uh, further and further in time, I would like to show you this about uh, Jan van Eyck. I don't know how far I am advancing in time. Uh, maybe I can look, it's uh, still five minutes, I have the impression, yeah. I'll be quick about that. So you see here the portrait of Jan van Eyck. He was a 15th century painter, Flemish painter. He's called the father of oil painting. 
not because he invented it, but because he showed the world what you could do with oil painting. Before, the big painters like Giotto, etc., mostly Italians, they paint with a mixture of pigments, but not with oil as a binding medium. They use egg white. And egg white dries very much quicker, and that allows the artist much less degrees of freedom in changing what he is painting. So Van Eyck, he introduced oil painting. And one of his most famous works is called the Ghent Altarpiece, also the Lamb of God. Huh? You see the Lamb here. Huh? The Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world in full. And uh, yeah, this painting, this, this, this is a polyptych. It's in the Ghent Cathedral in Belgium. This is three by five meters. And it, this, this, uh, this polyptych is considered to be the, uh, the end, the, the work that ends the Renaissance and starts new, uh, uh, no, the end of the, the medieval painting and the starting of the Renaissance, I'm sorry. So um, this is being restored now. And uh, what we have been looking at is the outer panels. Eh? So if you close this polyptych, you see this. You see, for instance, Mary, eh? this is an Annunciation scene. Mary gets the message that she will be the mother of God. And these two outside panels, these are the people that paid for the polyptych. These are the donors, the sponsors. Yeah? And we will focus on these two. Um, but first, a little bit on the Virgin Mary. Yeah? So normally, when you use the traditional way of X-ray radiography, you shoot X-rays through, you see this kind of lattice work. Yeah? It looks a bit like the Virgin Mary is behind bars. That's because it's very thin wood, and there is a lattice work behind to, to strengthen, to keep it flat. Yeah? It's called, uh, it's, a, it's a standard procedure. And with X-ray radiography, well, you see that, you don't really see the, the, the details. But if we scan this with our method, we really see the details very well. And while well, you see some changes here, you see all kinds of damages, actually, which were repaired and parts where there is no, no longer paint. Um, but for the rest, it's not that terribly informative. Nevertheless, when we look at uh, these donor portraits, so the, the wife of the donor, huh? originally she looked like this with a lot of yellowed varnish, and this is the situation after the varnish has been removed. Now, when so varnish removal is a rather painstaking procedure. Eh? You have to scratch away, and you have to make sure that you don't scratch away too much. Nevertheless, the people that do this, they are very much very close to the painting, so they, they get to know this painting very intimately. And they had the idea that something was wrong with the, with the dress, the red part of the dress of this lady. They had the idea that sometimes they saw a different pattern of painting in some areas, than what should be the real way, the, the way Van Gogh has painted this. Turns out that, and so what they, they, they saw after a while is that there were two layers, two red layers. And what you see here is what they call a test window, is where they remove the top layer. Yeah? And so you see indeed the lower layer is a bit paler and a bit older, more, less well in less good condition. But what they saw there of the details of the way this lower red dress was painted, this reminded them much more of the way Van Eyck was supposed to paint. Whereas normally everything should have been painted by Van Eyck. But they recognized this part better. And so they were starting to consider this to be maybe not painted by Van Eyck, but an overpainting. So that the lower part, the lower dress, red dress, first version, was original, and that was not original. So they asked us to clarify this, to find indications that there was a difference, a chemical difference between the lower dress, one below, and the one on top. Although, gradually speaking, eh, they're both painted with a, with a red lake pigment, which is an organic lake, which is the same. So, we scan this, eh, and then you don't really, on first sight, you don't really see too much differences. But there is a big difference when you look at copper. Eh? So there is a lot of copper here in the green sleeves. That's normal. A lot of pigments that contain copper are green. 
But there is also copper in the red dress, which was very strange, which nobody understood. And in this window, which was opened into the lower part, there is no copper there. So there is only copper in the upper level, yeah? which was a lucky break for us because we could more easily see where the upper layer was, and it was everywhere. Yeah? So this was one of the indications. We call this uh, the smoking gun, let's say, uh, that actually the entire dress of this lady was not painted by Van Eyck, was overpainted. It was originally painted in the 16th century, but maybe 100 years later, when the condition of the paint was bad, was overpainted, but very thoroughly, completely. And the same for her husband. So he has this much more uh, intense red garment he's wearing. If you look through the surface, you see that it's actually full of patches. Huh? So there are all kinds of holes in, which were covered over. So this was, you see this here very clearly. Huh? So there are all kinds of holes filled up with something containing a lot of iron. And you see these holes also in the mercury image. And uh, if, we, if you look at cross-sections, if you take bits of paint, you see that there are actually here two, two red layers. One which we see now, which is this thin layer, and one which is below, which is thicker, and that's the original one. So we see the same pattern, that there is an overpaint layer on top of the original. And so the conclusion of all this was actually that these two pa panels of the donors were very significantly overpainted. That's what's in red. But actually also in the other panels. And so this was a kind of momentous discovery, let's say. Well, it was not our discovery, we just confirmed it in an objective way. And so what was ha what's happened now is that this already fairly long restoration procedure has now been extended for two years to remove all this non-original paint, to remake, to make again visible the original layers by Van Gogh. Yeah? So this was a nice result uh, because we could see, uh, we could objectively make the difference between what was original and not. Yeah, this is another video. Uh, I think I will end with that. It gives you an idea what our scanner does. Yeah, maybe I should... Uh... Let it do this. Yeah, so this is a kind of speeded up movie, but you figured that out yourself, of course. Eh? So uh, this, our scanner is being built in front of this panel that is waiting to be scanned. A lot of people, a lot of photographs, a lot of waiting. And then after a while, Everything is ready, and our scanner starts moving. Eh? So it does this, and it uh, slowly goes up too. So usually this scanning is, uh, it, it looks like it's moving relatively fast, but of course it's a, it's a speeded up video. So we normally let this machine run overnight, eh? and then uh, the hours go by unattended, and uh, we just occasionally have a look what's happening. Slowly the evening falls, yeah? light goes out, and then uh, after about 12 hours or so, uh, our scan is then finished. This is how we operate our scanner. I don't know whether anything interesting else is coming. Yeah, and the next day, uh, uh, a lot of quick movements. And some more scanning. You see that our instrument is self-built. Huh? And uh, yeah, this is a bit of a close-up. So we're about a centimeter before the painting. It looks a bit closer here, but there is no chance that we scratch off the paint. And we make sure that that's not happening. And the last part of this scan was uh, that uh, the central part of the triptych or the polyptych, the lab itself was being scanned. And you see this here. Yeah, so this is, more, this is in an enclosed area. If you visit Ghent Cathedral, normally you can come a bit closer. Eh? But while we were scanning, uh, the public could only watch through the doors of this chapel where this polyptych is in. Eh? Um, 
if you really want to visit this uh, magnificent piece of art, you have to go to Ghent after September, but until September, the panels are not available because we're doing something with them. Okay, so I talked a little bit about chemical imaging, history and art and virtual archaeology, and not so much about durability. So thank you. Thank you for a very nice lecture. So now it's time for the audience for questions. Yes. Ah, spatial resolution. Well, um, uh, normally, uh, because time is, is, is limited, usually, um, what people want when the question is art historical, they want to see how the artist painted and what he painted. So uh, a, a relevant spatial resolution there is of the order of uh, half a millimeter. That's already quite okay. If uh, we're not talking about big paintings, but miniatures, like that, huh? so on, uh, and in an illuminated manuscript, we sometimes do that too, then the scale is already smaller, and the brushes are finer. There, we normally scan at 50 micron spatial resolution. But we normally don't scan 50, with 50 micron a big painting. Eh? It would take forever. It's also not so relevant. Sometimes it is relevant. If there is some degradation and you have bits of one paint brush or one paint stroke that have degraded can be relevant to, to look at the upper part of a line of paint. And then maybe it's 100 micron or something like that. So it's a bit variable. It depends on the problem. Yeah. But it usually depends on how much time we have to. Another question, maybe? Uh, for the first Van Gogh you have shown, you were using the synchrotron radiation. Yes. Uh, was this your first trial or was there any other reason? Because now you have a very nice device that doesn't need yes. the synchrotron light. Yes. Um, actually, uh, we were... Yeah, the reason why we did this first experiment at the synchrotron, where you have much more energy, higher energy and much more intensity, is that we wanted to make sure that if we would see something very weak, we would still see it. But afterwards, it turned out that, yeah, the signals we can collect are usually not so weak. And therefore, the, the need to have very high intensity was not really there. We only thought that would be the case. Um, actually, uh, the other reason why I considered a synchrotron to be interesting was that we could use fairly high energy. And so with high energy, obviously, uh, heavy elements are more easily excited. And also, uh, damage to the painting is less. Huh? Because the higher the energy is, it's maybe a bit contraintuitive, but the higher the energy of the radiation is, the more flies through and doesn't leave behind any energy. Whereas if you go to fairly low energies, you tend to ionize a lot more efficiently carbon and nitrogen, so the, the elements which are in the binding medium. And then you deposit much more. And that's the case, yeah. But we've, we've seen in the meantime, by moving out of the synchrotron to X-ray tubes, that if you don't use relatively high energies, like 50, 60 kilo electron volts, but only 20, it's still OK. And there is no, there is no damage. OK. Thank you. Somebody else? Please, if you can pass the microphone. Uh, which color would you say that is most problematic from the aspect of aging visually? Is it green? Ah, which color? You mean that it change of, of, yeah. of degradation? It depends a bit on the period. Um, so um, I did not really show this, but uh, we studied very extensively paintings by Van Gogh and other painters which were active at the end of the 19th century in the beginning of the 20th century. These painters, usually, they paint with a lot more pigments than the painters from before. 
and that's because there are more pigments, right? because the chemi chemical industry had uh, uh, yeah, started there in earnest. But some of the new pigments which were introduced in that period, uh, yeah, they were so new that nobody knew very well whether they would last or not, eh? whether they were sensitive to light or not. And so, for instance, Van Gogh and Monet, etc., they use a number of pigments which are fairly light sensitive, like chromium yellow. Eh? Um, before, if we go to the Baroque period, well, let's say the, the, the 14th, uh, so the oil period painting, so 15th century, 16th, 17th, their painters work in guilds, and guilds, they had, uh, they had uh, rules. Eh? They told their members which pigments to use and which not, and how they should use them. And those rules were useful because they were a kind of guidelines to ensure the quality of the pigments. And that included uh, not to use materials which were, uh, uh, yeah, which, which, which degraded after, let's say, 100 years. So there, obviously, you have less, uh, a less big, large variety of pigments, and most of them are stable. So in there, there are a number of problematic pigments. Green is one of them in the sense that some of the greens, uh, like verdigris, which is green earth, sometimes indeed can lose its color because the copper diffuses away, and then you get something transparent. But it's, not, it's, it's only one. Eh? Uh, another problematic pigment is our, our orangey arsenic sulfides. So this is orpiment and uh, realgar. These are also, the, so they, they tend to lose, they become transparent. So they lose their fairly strong orange yellow. So this, this realgar uh, and orpiment, they were used by a number of painters that like to paint flower pieces with very strong orange flowers in them. They just disappear, these flowers. Huh? So that changes the entire composition. What is another problematic pigment in, for, for Baroque paint? is sometimes mercury sulfide, so red, um, that sometimes becomes black. Uh, yeah, that's about it, I think. Yeah, so there are, there are quite a few problems. Some of the blues also tend to become black. Ultramarine blue or lazurite sometimes becomes black, yeah. It's called ultramarine disease. But luckily, not altogether. It depends a little bit on the conditions, on what ground there is, and also which pigments are in the neighborhood, and whether they're well covered by other layers, things like that. OK. Another question, maybe? If not, maybe just one more technical from my side. <laughs> uh, has anybody studied, from the point of view of radiation damage, where is the limit? When you, you, have, you know you have to ah, stop by yes. shining of yeah, yeah, yeah. X-rays. Uh, well, uh, with the scanning, uh, uh, what we normally do is uh, our, our scanner moves, but in every position it usually stays a fraction of a second. Let's say uh, 200 milliseconds or something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Or 100 milliseconds if we're in a hurry. Uh, something like this. So uh, we, we've done these provocation studies. Uh, when when, from when do you start seeing uh, discoloration when you are, for instance, on a very wide area? So this usually is after 15 minutes or so. Okay. Right? So there is a factor of at least a thousand between what we do okay. and uh, when, when, when you see, start seeing something. Uh, I, I've had this question already several times, and so what I've also calculated was the dose that the painting gets or each position gets compared to, for instance, when you transport a painting from Europe to the US huh? in the plane, okay. it also gets a dose. Okay. Of course, not the same wavelengths, but anyhow, you can compare the dose more or less. And then I came up that if you would transport this painting 10 times, you have about the same dose as when we do this scan. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, transport. I guess during the transport, I think the shaking of the airplane will be more uh, harmful than, than the radiation. Yeah. Okay. If 
there are no other questions. Thank you very much again. Yep. Thank you. And uh, we, you are invited also to join us for a discussion below after the lecture. Thank you.